Hello and welcome. We're back with another edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Our guest is Suzanne McCormick, President and CEO of YMCA of the USA, also known as The Y. My name is Neil Parikh. I'm the executive producer and guest host, and I'll be in the chair today interviewing Suzanne. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. We're also live on Suzanne's Facebook and Twitter account. Thank you so much, Suzanne. It's great to be back with you. We took a few weeks off at the end of summer, and uh, I am thrilled to be interviewing Suzanne McCormick. I got to know her when I was at United Way, and she was the U.S. president for United Way. She's been at the Y now for almost exactly a year. Uh, this week was her one year anniversary. Uh, we'll be talking to, to her about uh, the great work that the Y does. Uh, we'll also talk about, of course, Queen Elizabeth, uh, the uh, transition uh, in the British monarchy. We'll talk about September 11. We'll also talk about the fall arts preview, typically the largest issue, the largest Sunday paper in the New York Times. Uh, but first, we want to give you a general preview of what's to come, and then we'll welcome uh, all the folks who are watching. Again, please share, retweet, like, comment, tell your friends, mention friends, mention your friends in the comments. I'm sure they'll want to watch. Here's a little preview. We're back with another edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Our guest is Suzanne McCormick, the 15th person and first woman to serve as president and CEO of YMCA of the USA. Neil Parikh will guest host. The Y is a leading nonprofit committed to strengthening community through youth development, healthy living, and social responsibility. Just this week, Suzanne celebrated her one year anniversary with the Y after 20 years with United Way the last two as its U.S. president. We'll ask her to reflect on what she learned over the past year. We'll also ask her about the wise efforts to welcome new immigrants and their civic engagement work focusing on youth. Founded in London in 1844, the Y has grown into one of the largest organizations focused on strengthening communities in the U.S. and around the world, serving more than 64 million people in 120 countries. In July, Suzanne joined 1,200 others for the YMCA World Council meeting in Denmark. We'll certainly talk about Queen Elizabeth II, who passed away on Thursday after more than 70 years on the throne. Sunday also marks the 21st anniversary of 9-11. We will take time to reflect on that as well. Sri Srinivasan is our host. I am the executive producer and occasional guest host, Neil Pared. Paula Kiger helps produce the show, engaging with the audience on Facebook and LinkedIn. Sri has been hosting the New York Times Read Along for almost seven years with some amazing guests. The show is produced by Digimentors. We produce high quality virtual and hybrid events for organizations big and small around the world. We also do social and digital consulting, training, and workshops. Again, Suzanne McCormick is our guest, live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. That's a preview of what's to come today. Let's go ahead and welcome some of the folks who are watching on the various uh, channels. Doug Levy is joining us from Northern California. Doug, always great to see you. 5.30 a.m. his time. Thank you as always. Pradhyan Haldapur is joining us from closer to where I am. I'm based in Springfield, Virginia. And she's in Silver Spring, Maryland. And she's saying hello, good morning to the Sriniverse. Uh, Diane Stefani is saying hi. Uh, she's from, watching from Margate, New Jersey. Uh, so thrilled to see the real, New York Times Real Long team back after a short break. Thank you, Diane. We miss you as well. Katie Adamson is watching uh, from Arlington. Uh, Katie, I know, is a, a YMCA 
YMCA advocate. Thank you for sharing the show on Twitter, Katie. And she says, go Suzanne. Linda Lawrence is watching from Long Island. Linda, thank you for joining us. And hi, mom. And my mom keeping it real. She's watching from Hastings on Hudson and is the first person to mention 9-11. Of course, today is the 21st anniversary uh, since the horrible attacks of 9-11. Uh, we will talk about that, of course, later in the show. And we'll, we'll take a chance, take a, a moment to reflect on, uh, you know, have people share where, where they were when they heard the news and what it means to them 21 years since that day. Um, Pradhyaya say hi to my mom. Thank you, Pradhyaya. Miriam Berkeley is watching from Hell's Kitchen, New York. I do say it uh, almost every week, but if you haven't had a chance to see Miriam's puddle reflections or photographs on Facebook, they're definitely worth checking out. Um, please you know, click on her page, check out her pictures. They're definitely worth it. Manuel is watching. Thank you, Manuel. Paula Tiger is watching from New York City this time. Paula Tiger is our producer uh, engaging with the audience on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, she's up in New York for a quick trip, but she never um, uh, stops from producing our show, regardless of where she's where she's at. Um, and Fredney is saying, I can't believe that 9-11 uh, is an entire generation ago. Absolutely. Joan is watching from Philadelphia. Thank you, Joan. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be talking about 9-11. Uh, um, but we want to make sure, folks, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, please like, comment, and share. Our guest is Suzanne McCormick, President and CEO of the YMCA of the USA. She is the first woman president of the Y. And uh, before we uh, bring her on, we're going to just uh, take a look at what's in the paper today. Uh, so we'll go ahead and switch to the New York Times camera. Uh, and what I always think is interesting is to take a look at the ads today. In today's section, there is a uh, full page ad uh, for Bloomingdale, not just a full page ad, a gatefold. And it'll be hard to see with this camera, but if you open it up, it's a full, full ad, over 300 celebration worthy exclusives at Bloomingdale for 50 remarkable, 150 remarkable years. And this came wrapped around the outside of the paper today. Always good to take a look at what we have uh, for advertising and another sign that the paper is doing well. So we'll take a look at the front page sections of the paper. Um, the uh, This is also, I'm going to lift it up for a second because you can't tell, but this is the typically the largest paper of the year. It has the fall arts preview. So let's take a look at what we have. We have the front page. The display story is about a, uh, an investigation that the New York Times did on schools in um, Hasidic schools in New York State. Um, questions about where, how much money they are getting from the state and how much money is being used for instruction. Um, Ukraine is the lead story on the right, uh, two leads uh, as well. And it's interesting that the queen is off the uh, top of the page, at least. When you flip it over and look at the bottom, we have the U.S. Open champion, um, the women's champion, Trump. And the Queen story is just at the bottom right corner. In bidding farewell to Queen, Britain grapples with identity. Um, we'll take a look at Friday's paper as well to give you a sense of how they covered it um, right after her, her passing. But let's take a look at the rest of the paper here. Set this aside. And there we go. The Sunday Opinion. Now that's a, a nice um, dominant picture. If you can see the throne. What is Britain without Queen Elizabeth? Long a beacon of stability, she leaves behind a country reckoning with its uncertain future. So we'll definitely take a look at that. We have the Sunday Styles, which is under no one's thumb. Jan Wenner talked about running Rolling Stone the way he wanted by Maureen Dowd. 
And there is a piece about the top on top of that Queen Elizabeth and her legacy of power dressing. I ah, we got lucky two Sunday opinions this week. I guess there are a lot of opinions in there, or they're really important. Um, Sunday business. Sick babies, but no scandal. That's interesting. Scorched earth legal tactics helped Abbott outmaneuver families whose infants were given its formula. That is not good. That is not good at all. Clear some of the uh, duplicate sections out of the way. Let's see, what else do we have? We have, here is the fall arts preview I was telling you about. The new season arts and leisure. Um, let's see what's here. This is the, the, the section is all in one piece here. Part one, theater is right there. The book review. Panic button, Max Fisher's The Chaos Machine examines the psychological impact of technology. Let's take a look at that. Here's the new season, Arts and Leisure. Um, part two, theater, dance, classical. Uh, what's so funny, as some like it hot and ain't no mo, head to Broadway, 10 artists reflect on men in dresses, gender, and what works and what doesn't on the modern day stage. We have Part three, film, television. The cover story is about warrior women. Um, Co-stars of Wakanda Forever, I'm getting back together after Black Panther and mourning the loss of Chadwick Boseman. And we have part four, pop and books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's made a lasting impression on the early 2000s, early aughts. Rock scene in New York. The trio reunite for Cool It Down, the first album in almost a decade. So that's part four. Part five. Art, art and architecture. Older, wiser, cooler. Um, in a 35 year career to be celebrated at the Museum of Modern Art, Wolfgang Tillman has blurred the line between party and protest, but increasingly it's politics on his mind. New York Times Magazine, interesting cover, how educators and students are navigating the hyper-politicized terrain of American education. So a lot of uh, stickers that you expect to see on a laptop. Interesting cover design. This is the, uh, the extra section of the front page section. For uh, printing presses outside of New York, they can't handle all of the pages of the front section. So this gets printed as a separate piece. So we'll certainly look through that later. And as I promised, we want to also look at uh, the, the pages from uh, the And hopefully you can hear me again. Um, Paula, you'll tell me when we lost audio. Hopefully you have audio now. Great. Um, Paula, let me know in the uh, notes, when did we lose audio? What section did we, uh, did we lose that on? Thank you for bearing with us. Sorry for the technical glitch. Um, we will proceed as I, I went, went through the paper. Hopefully you saw the last, um, the cover of the Friday paper. This was when, after the queen died on Thursday.
Sorry, and the audio is back. If at first you don't succeed, if at first you don't succeed, hopefully you can hear me now. Uh, again, Paula, I'm looking for a thumbs up that you can hear. Yeah, we go. You can hear me, right? Great. Okay. So sorry about that. Obviously, some kind of a glitch on my end, and uh, I apologize for that but I have my phone. So uh, we are gonna go ahead and bring on Suzanne McCormick uh, to uh, talk about the why and her experience uh, over the past year as the first woman president and CEO of the why. So there, there we go. We're gonna bring on Suzanne McCormick. Good morning. Suzanne, Will. good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure working with you at United Way for several years. Uh, I left about two years ago. You actually were on the show two years ago, uh, just after I had left. And then last year you joined the Why. That's um, true. So before I ask you about the Why, I want to ask you uh, just in general. It's been two and a half years now since the pandemic started. Um, how has how have you fared? How has your family been? Hopefully, you've uh, enjoyed generally good general good health. Yes, I mean we when when you look at you know all the all the challenges and suffering that so many people had, um, it would be you know you we had it probably as you know mild as as anybody. You know my my daughter was able to start college. Um, and so she's in her second year now. I mean, of course, we've we've all had COVID at some point, but nothing significant. Uh, for me, the greatest challenge was um, starting a new job um, virtually and getting to know a new team virtually. Um, that was I'm I'm one of those I, I call us COVID CEOs or you know people. I, I I've met other CEOs from other organizations or even when I was in the United Way that network. Um, and so the challenge of starting a new job virtually, I think, was when I look back, was one of my biggest personal challenges. I would say. Absolutely, I can certainly. Uh, understand that. And there are a number of people, you know, the idea of starting a job uh, during the pandemic, get, not necessarily getting to meet everyone right away. Uh, and it's also challenging for you. You live in Tampa, so you're going between Tampa and Chicago as well, right? I am. And if, I, I, I'm been all over the place. Uh, so Tampa is still um, anchor home and I uh, have an apartment in Chicago. And so I'm a little bit in Tampa right now. Um, more time in Chicago and a lot of time uh, out and about meeting and um, across the country, which has been fantastic, meeting our wide leaders and team members and volunteers. That's just been such a exciting and fulfilling part of the role. Sure, sure. Let's go ahead and uh, check in, see a few other people who are joining us again. Um, let's see some of the comments that have come in uh, since we, 
looked at the paper. Um, Pradnia jumped into LinkedIn to share it with folks there. So thank you, Pradnia. Um, and let's see. Katie is doing a good job of sharing the show with some of her colleagues. Uh, I do recognize Neil Denton. Uh, she's asking if Jim and Kelly are watching as well. Are those, they also uh, Y colleagues of yours? They are. Though they're, they're, they're some um, super members of our government relations team um, around the country. Great, great. I know I I uh, interacted with Neil a little bit on Twitter. Uh, I know he was very close with Steve Taylor, who was our public policy guy yes. at United Way. So uh, thank you, Neil, for you sharing the show and retweeting um, uh, some of the posts from yesterday. Yeah, Neil, uh, Neil is our, our executive vice president of government relations, and he's the most prolific um, uh tweeter that we have and you can't you can't go to a meeting with with neil um and anybody you can't go to a meeting with anybody and neil not take a picture that's that's just the rule <laughs> absolutely absolutely that, I, I mean it helps too oh yeah right um so let's see and you did a good job we'll we'll talk about the uh nonprofit times uh top 50 uh leaders he was at the event you you missed the event unfortunately you were I traveling did. Um, I was in Chicago this week. We have our, um, we were preparing for in uh, week after next, we have what we call our association assemblies. It's our um, annual large gathering of all of our CEOs and then our chief volunteer officers. And so we were preparing for that, which is taking place the week of the 19th. And that's when we talk about sort of the state of the why um, we're rolling out a new strategic plan. And um, so I had to be in Chicago and I just couldn't get a flight to DC. But Neil, sure. I know it's a good representative. It's a great event. I got to go last year and oh my gosh, it's so humbling to be in the company of so many amazing um, nonprofit colleague leaders. Absolutely. And here's just a uh, reminder, Paula is sharing links in our Facebook account. Um, to uh, um, you know, some relevant information, she shared the link to your background, so folks would uh, know. People are watching on your page, of course, know all about your background and have been friends. Thank you, folks who are watching on on Suzanne's page as well. Um, let's see other comments that have come in. Uh, so that's that's good from there. So why don't we go ahead and talk a little bit about the work that the Y does. Um, I wanna share uh, a few slides. Um, and you can tell us a little bit about, you know, the wise focus, for example, there are three main areas that the wise focus. Yes. Neil, I can't hear you. I don't know if folks can hear me. I can just keep talking. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, you were present. So yeah, we 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 do focus on. It, it, it seems simple. Three areas: youth development, healthy living, and social responsibility. But it is so much more than that. I mean, our our mission is really to to strengthen communities, um, specifically by focusing on children, young people. Um, uh, and families, as well as individuals. Um, in youth development, we have sort of four four big program areas. Um, summer camping, some folks um, um, probably are familiar with a Y summer camp. Um, uh, child development or child care. Um, what, what people may not know is that we are the largest nonprofit provider of child development or child care um, in the country. Um, we also are the largest provider of out of school time youth development programming. Um, and then of course, um, uh, folks are really probably very familiar with the fun recreational sports activities um, like swimming. We're a leader in uh, water safety and teaching kids and their families to be safe around water, um, teaching swim lessons. Um, as well as all kinds of other sports. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Y, um, but we have some some of the most popular sports in the country were actually started at YMCA. So that's sports are fundamental to what we do. Um, but sports and youth, that, that's really um, a platform for um, team building, character development, and helping kids build a sense of belonging. Um, so uh, that that's youth development. Um, 
And in the area of healthy living, you know, we're looking at whole person health, not only physical health, but mental well-being. And then we use social responsibility to talk about this big bucket of work that we do um, uh, leading in communities um, around emerging needs or critical needs that other nonprofits may not be addressing. Um, and we saw a lot of wise step into um, that space during the COVID pandemic, um, doing things like senior outreach, um, we delivered over, distributed over 100 million pounds of food. Um, so just it's this plethora of programs that support the fabric of community and build strong kids and their families. And you mentioned um, you mentioned the sports uh, history of the Y. Let's go take a look at uh, that real quick. Basketball yes. was invented at the Y, right? Basketball was invented at the Y. I had to, I have to admit, I had to read up on my history. Um, it was, uh, I, so I have, to, I have to look at my notes. Um, it was invented um, uh, by a, a gentleman by the name of Jim James, Naismith. Yep, James right. Na Naismith. And um, uh, it, it was, it was the director of the Y where he went um, needed a game to occupy what he called a class of incorrigibles. Um, and those were, he was working with a group of, of YMCA directors who weren't really interested in sports like rugby or football. Um, and so he, he charged Naismith with going out and um, inventing something different for them to do. And he came back with a game of basketball. Um, also, the, the games of racquetball and volleyball were invented at YMCA's as well. Um, so that was really interesting for me when I joined the organization. The history is just so rich. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the two other things that I was going to pull out uh, from history uh, was the wise work with the uh, children uh, who were in the internment camps. Um, yeah. Yes, and and Neil, I have a a, a a real life story I could share about that. We have um, we have a new CEO leader of our YMCA in Silicon Valley, California. Um, his name is uh, Jim Horry, and um, his his first experience with the YMCA wasn't his; it was his father's. His father's family was in one of the Japanese internment camps. And um, the YMCA was there um, providing the sports programs and his dad got to participate in that. Um, and so that's just, I, I did not know that until I met Jim. Actually, I just met Jim last, last month and he's the one who told me that story. And then I went back and read the history about it. Wow. Um, as, a, as a comment coming in, first of all, our... Okay, so I see my camera is not happy. I'll go back to my cell phone. My apologies. How about that? Um, so I was going to say that uh, Jim uh, did log on to watch uh, taking Katie's cue. Uh, and he's watching from the uh, north woods of Minnesota. So thank you, Jim, for joining us. Uh, and Pragna uh, said that her kids spent several summers at the Y um, here in Silver Spring. Oh, that's great. I'll, I'll share my, I have uh, two connections to the Y, um, both, you know, at the very early um, uh, start of my, my, um, my life, I actually learned, took a few lessons in judo at the Y in Yonkers at Getty Square. Uh, back when I was in fifth grade, I still remember uh, a friend of mine, Mary Stevens, her father taught the class of there and he used to pick up, uh, pick, me and a uh, friend, Mia McGinty, up. Um, funny the things that you remember, right? I probably yeah. haven't thought about that in years. Uh, well, and and then when I was in Washington State working at uh, United Way of Snohomish County, we wor worked very closely with the YMCA of Snohomish County. Uh, and we shared a lot of the same board members and major donors. We were, you know, they were one of our uh, best partners uh, in our work there. So, uh, it was a great relationship with the with the Y. Well, when I'm when I'm traveling, Neil, I, I um, it is if I have on usually when I'm traveling, I either have my YMCA lapel pin on or you know um, 
a logoed shirt and it never fails that someone stops me and asks me if I work for the why and then they tell me their why stories. Um, I have heard so many why stories, which to me is, um, it just gives me so much pride to work for the organization. Um, there's so many people that feel a connection to it. And sure. that's what we want to continue to build on and grow um, as we think about the future of the organization. Sure. And and Katie is sharing that the, the why invented camping. Oh, that's well. right. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a whole lot of history that you could learn from the why if you go to their their website. Um, and it was founded in London in 1844, if Correct. I'm not mistaken, that's and then very quickly brought to the U.S. a few years later. So rich history here. Yeah. The first why was started in um, Boston um, at the Old South Church in 1851, I think. Um, so that was that was the first. Yeah. Um, so tell us, uh, um, and Brendan is giving you two thumbs up for good brand representation um, for the why. Uh, you've been uh, there now for a year. Uh, I think it was it was earlier this week. You celebrated your one year anniversary. Yes, the day after Labor Day, I started. The day after, yeah. day after Labor Day. Um, what what surprised you most uh, over the course of that year in terms of, uh, you know, what did you know about the Y going in and what surprised you after, after a year? I think one of the, um, uh, I think one of the things that I, I don't, I guess I'll say surprise, but I've really come to appreciate is, um, the longevity, like the tenure of our team members across the country. Um, there are so many of our leaders now or our program directors who started in the Y, um, who had a first job often when they were in high school or uh, possibly college and then continued on through their career um, and are still with the Y. And uh, I attribute that to um, uh, historically the Y having a really strong leadership development program. Um, that's something that um, uh, contracted somewhat during COVID. And so it's an area of the organization that we're working right now um, to build back with a real focus on what do we need for our, um, our, our leaders for the future. Um, so, uh, that that was sort of surprising, and um, I really appreciate it. Um, and the other is um, just the the con the degree to which YMCA's are so present and active in countries around the world. Um, you know, when we were at United Way, United Way also has a global presence. But um, I would say the Y is has I think a deeper, more established presence. And the um, variety of different programs that the Y leads, depending on what those countries need, um, is just, it's fascinating and um, really inspirational. Um, so those, those are two areas that um, I did not appreciate um, having not really worked in a Y. I had worked just like you in partnership with two different YMCAs in two different communities when I was leading the United Way. Um, but, it, and I would say the other thing, Neil, is this rich history, this deep history of an organization that has been so connected into um, the fabric of American society. Um, you know, we talked about we talked about the sports that were invented there. Um, Father's Day was also invented at the YMCA. Um, it's just it is it's it's pretty mind blowing um, how, where the Y has contributed and how the Y has contributed. Absolutely. Um... And uh, you know the history of the Y. One of the things that that I learned, and I hadn't realized how much work the Y had done uh, has done in terms of civic engagement uh, around the youth and government work. It's not just the advocacy on Capitol Hill, which nonprofits need to be involved in for a myriad of, of policy issues. And I'm sure Neil appreciates uh, that plug. But it's also the the education of our youth and getting them involved in the process. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, we have a program that is one of my favorites. Um, this is this is well, I should say this was a surprise for me. This was a program that I was not familiar with uh, when I started at the Y, and it's called Youth in Government. And this program engages 
thousands of high school students around um, the country in um, what we describe as like state organized model government experiences. Um, and so it, 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 and most of the programming happens in schools, in partnerships with schools. Um, but if you can imagine, high school students are learning about the civic engagement process. They learn about um, how you know policies, bills are introduced. Um, they they learn sort of how to run for a position in state government. They learn how to. Uh, they learn public speaking, they learn how to debate. And um, in most states on an annual basis, well, we're getting back to this in person, um, then those those um, those youth and government um, delegates, we call them, they, they come together actually in their own uh, state house and they have the opportunity to debate bills on the floor of their legislature. And these are bills that the students have um, that they have developed themselves. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating. And it's, uh, and then the other thing that, that happens with youth in government, and I had the opportunity to attend um, the week long, we, we have a, a annual conference and that took place in June. So we had all of the, the youth in government governors and uh, um, vice governors. Uh, I'm not sure of all the terminology yet. I still have to practice on that, but they all came to Washington and again, had more opportunity to work on public speaking. Um, and then also got to go up to the Hill. This is a picture of all of our um, youth and government delegates, along with some of our other youth leaders who are in some of our other um, uh, civic engagement programs called Achievers and Changemakers. Um, we all we brought them all to Capitol Hill and then they went and did visits. Um, I had the opportunity to tag along with our um, youth governor from um, Wisconsin, along with two of our change makers um, and got to um, watch them interact with their senator and advocate for um, the things that are most important to them. Um, so it's, this is one of my favorite programs. Uh, and the reason is, is because when you spend time with these kids, two things, first of all, they ask the smartest, hardest questions. And secondly, um, they, they, they really connect to our four core values as the framework for their work together. And those are caring, honesty, respect, and responsibility. And so when they engage in conversation or engage in debate, you know, they do it with vim and vigor and compassion and conviction. Um, but when it's over, they spend a lot of time trying to appreciate each other's different perspectives. And, and I've said to um, groups of our young people on numerous occasions, uh, so many of our adult lawmakers need to learn from you. Um, you know, how they show up and how they engage is really in the most civil, respectful way. It's hugely sure, sure. inspiring. And Katie makes a, a good point that our the youth and government programs are, um, you know, restoring dialogue to our politics. Uh, as you mentioned, they're role models for some of our uh adult politicians, if you yeah. will. And you know, actually when you when you're on the hill um, and we do do visits, there are there are lots of um, Hill staff who, when you meet them in you know the office of a representative or a senator, will say, "Oh, I was a youth and government kid," and we actually have um, at some representatives themselves who have participated in in youth and government. Um, when I when I first joined the YMCA, I got some reach outs on Facebook from some of my former. Um, state representatives in Maine who had participated in youth and government. Um, it's a program we would love to grow um, and make um, accessible to more kids. It really is so positive. Sure, sure. Uh, we also want to uh, ask you about Welcoming Week. Uh, here's a screenshot of uh, the U.S. Uh, pins where there are events uh, around the country. Welcoming Week is an effort to welcome uh, new immigrants and refugees um, to the various communities where they're being uh, uh, integrated. Uh, tell us about that a little bit. Well, this this is another um, this is a another program or initiative that I was not familiar with necessarily until I joined the Y. Um, we participate in Welcoming Week in partnership with an organization called Welcoming America, um, and it, this uh, is another one that's becoming near and dear to my heart because. 
Um, my first job when I came back from serving as a U.S. Peace Corps was um, working for an organization called the International Center, which helped newly arrived immigrants and refugees get acclimated to life in America. So this initiative is um, it's, it's a perfect partnership for us because uh, at the Y, you know, our motto is for all. Um, we want we want everyone to feel like they can belong in a Y. And so Welcoming Week, which is happening right now um, through next weekend, I think, um, our Ys across the country in partnerships with different organizations potentially in their communities are organizing events to highlight um, the the. Um, the value that um, uh, new Americans, uh, newcomers to the United States, immigrants and refugees bring to our communities. Um, and so they organize, uh, you can probably search on Facebook and find, or Twitter, I, that last night I, I was seeing lots of posts about upcoming events for the weekend. Um, one Y is doing, for example, an international food festival. Um, some Ys bring in, um, do, um, for example, lots of programs for children and family. Um, um, uh, reading stories from different cultures, um, having panels of uh, new Americans um, talking to their community. Um, it's just really, it's the um, lifts up that, that, that spirit of everyone is welcome in America. And they and and wise take it right down to the local level, so I encourage everyone who's listening to um, just search on um, on Facebook and also Twitter, um, and you'll be able to see some of the really cool activities. And hopefully, um, if there are activities happening in your uh, neck of the woods, as Al Roker would say, um, think about going to check them out. You're a fan of Al Roker as I well. Am a fan. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, Katie is is doing a great job of uh, sharing some additional context, um, mentioning that the Y was the first to teach English as a second language, uh, and has a history of welcoming uh, new immigrants. Uh, Katie is so, being a good wing woman to me today. Thank you, Katie. Absolutely, absolutely, and we all need to be welcomers, uh, and she's uh, welcoming, and and she might be watching. I, I believe she might be watching on your Facebook page. Um, so that's really helpful uh, for folks who are watching there as well. Thank you, Katie. Um, we also um, you know, need to talk about the global reach of the Y. Um, we talked about how it was founded in London. Uh, it's an international organization. Here's a picture of you speaking at the World Council meeting in Denmark earlier this summer. Um, you might recognize it from your Facebook post. Suzanne, thank you for letting me borrow it lovingly borrow it from there. Um, what was that like to go to Denmark? And it was like 1,200 other representatives of WISE from, from around the world? Yes, it was an incredible experience. Um, as I said, you know, I had not appreciated the degree to which the YMCA is so active in, um, in countries around the world. Um, I have so many stories I can share. Um, uh, so, so we had there were about 1,200 people, and there were delegations. It, it felt a bit, um, it felt a bit like the like you see delegations from um, wow. you know when you look at the Olympics, groups of people from different countries come, and so it wasn't just one or two representatives from a country; it was multiple representatives from a country. Um, we had about 170 leaders from America, both um, staff team members, um, CEOs, board members from around the country come. And it's an opportunity um, to learn together, to um, uh, talk about our shared vision um, in the world. And, um, and it's also just this wonderful opportunity for fellowship. Um, I personally had the opportunity to meet with the delegation from Africa, from Asia Pacific, from Australia, from Europe, from Latin America, um, and uh, also got to meet my colleagues who are leading their movements in other countries, which again was um, so inspiring. Um, our overall um, uh, world effort, efforts are led by my Facebook friend, um, Carlos Sanvi. Um, he is our general secretary and um, he is based out of Geneva. And he is the, he is the leader that keeps all of the countries um, connected and engaging. Um, a couple of the real standouts for me 
um, as you as you said, it was hosted in um, Aarhus, Denmark, and the YMCA in Denmark for the whole country has a staff of about only six or seven people. And the rest of their work, the majority of their work is done through volunteers. And they have um, just a huge cadre of um, young adult volunteers um, who are active um, in Denmark. And um, one of the, I think, really fun ways they recruit um, young people to be part of the YMCA is that right in the center of town in old historic Aarhus, which is this beautiful, you know, European city on one of the squares, um, they have the YMCA actually has um, uh, a bar. It's called Fair Bar. And it's it's um, all the proceeds from the bar go to support the work of the YMCA. And that's where they recruit people. People come into the bar, they understand all the proceeds go to the YMCA, and then they want to learn more about the work that the YMCA is doing. Um, and so that there's just probably shouldn't be promoting that, but but it was it's very much in the European culture, and I thought sure, it was sure. just a brilliant way um, to you know to recruit volunteers into the organization. Um, but it's um, for me this was just a, an amazing opportunity to get to be with my colleagues to learn, and I, I'm going to share two more stories with you. Um, spending time with um, our leaders from South Africa and Sierra Leone. Uh, they are doing some incredible peace building work with young people in their countries, um, which, you know, that one of the takeaways for me from our conversations were, uh, what can we learn from them that we could bring back to the dialogues that I believe we need to have in America um, at a time when we feel more divided than ever. Um, and then the other really, couple highlights is um, we have a very active YMCA in Ukraine. And I, you know, I saw the headline of the, of the paper this morning. Um, I think there are around 24 YMCAs in Ukraine. 17 of them are still active. Um, they are, they are um, helping refugees. They are um, distributing water filters um, food. Um, 17 of them are active. Most of them are volunteer led. Um, and um, there were a group of um, Ukraine young volunteers who were working also at World Council. They came over and were volunteering there and had the opportunity to talk to them. And it was just so inspiring, um, their resilience and their passion for their country. And in terms of the, uh, uh, again, the international nature Katie is sharing that um, the Y in Liberia um, was leading community response to the Ebola outbreak, uh, bringing chlorine vats through the community, radioing public health uh, public health messages to rural areas. Yeah, that's what. That, she yeah, also said every, it's, Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, in every country, the work of the Y um, is. It, can look different. I mean, it's all about strengthening communities and real focus on involving young people, but the obviously the issues in and the challenges in different countries are different. And so the why is doing different things depending on what their community needs, which is exactly our model here um, in communities across America. Sure. And Katie also added that small amounts of funding goes uh, so far around the world. Um, there's a world service campaign that raises money for wise internationally, uh, which is, which is great. My mom adds, uh, first of all, thank you for giving some of the background of the why, um, the history, uh, and also remind folks that the why has classes on yoga and exercise, which I'm sure during the pandemic must've been really, uh, important, a great place for, for people to connect, uh, virtually, right? You moved a lot of programs online, I assume? Yes, we did. And thank you, Mrs. Parekh, for that, for that shout out. I, I go to yoga at my, um, my uh, small Y um, here around the corner in Tampa when I'm home. Uh, yeah, we did, uh, Neil, like so many um, organizations, we moved a lot of our programming online, um, not only our health and well-being classes, um, we also did, um, we set up um, learning hubs for students to be able to come in if their parents had to go to work and couldn't leave them so they could come in and um, uh, go to virtual school with, um, you know, with Y staff 
um, supporting them and um, supervising them. Uh, we also did virtual um, check-ins with senior citizens. Um, but yes, lots of our programming, it really accelerated our sort of our launch into digital engagement. Um, so uh, many wise now you can just download a class on your phone and you know do it at home if you don't want to go into um, into a facility. Sure. Uh, and then one one last comment before we uh, turn our attention to the paper. And I'm going back. It was Pratnia that uh, put it up, and I'm gonna. This shouldn't surprise you, Suzanne. It's fun to stay at the Y MCA. <laughs> And as a Yankee fan, I certainly enjoyed, you know, they play uh, the song uh, during uh, the seventh inning. Uh, the ground crew does their uh, their their dance. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> folks are, I'm sure, familiar with the song, but from a from a serious perspective, what's the relationship between the why and the song now? Is it something that's kind of tongue in cheek and used? Do you actually play it and use that at events or? What's the I, um, you know, approach? I, no one has asked me that question before, Neil. So I can only <laughs> share my perspective. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. For example, at World Council, at one point we did sing YMCA and did um, the dance. Yeah, and, YMCA, and, we, did, and, yeah, and, right? and we did the dance. For me, it's a little. It, it, my my personal sort of tongue in cheek um, is, uh, I said last year on my on my. So my daughter, I said, is a freshman in college at Florida State University. And um, uh, I now know that if I wake up to a Snapchat from her um, that you know comes in after I've gone to sleep, it is likely a video of she and her friends out somewhere doing YMCA, um, you know, with in a club or somewhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think last year on our on our on our chat, I saved fourteen different versions of, <laughs> of Fiona and friends. And actually, just last week, I said she's back at college. I woke up to my first um, sophomore year, and I I will see how many I saved this year. <laughs> got it, got it. So it, it's not something that you necessarily shy away from, which is which is good. Maybe no, not an anthem I, per se, it, but. Well, I think if you've worked for the Y for as long as some of our leaders have, they're probably fatigued from hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, we have our, our friend Ron Thomas is watching from Dubai uh, and glad to have the show back. Thank you, Ron, for, for coming back. Always glad to have you. Um, and then Susan Jacobs uh, shared a comment, and I'm wondering whether she's another colleague of yours at the Y. I think uh, Katie had mentioned her earlier. Uh, she says, we continue to provide evidence-based uh, chronic disease programs virtually during COVID and now making sure our communities receive them in person as well. Yeah, Susan, thanks for lifting that up. One of the areas I haven't talked about is um, the why is such a leader in chronic disease prevention, um, uh, heart disease, but very much focused also on diabetes, hy hypertension, um, and um, and now getting more focused on mental health. And um, uh, yeah, um, just there's some phenomenal work that happened, is happening, um, and uh, the, the virtual, um, uh, reach outs and supports were lifesavers for so many people. Yeah, that's the thing. There's so many areas of our work um, that we could go deep in. Uh, again, sure. one of the reasons it's such an incredible organization to, to work for. Sure. Susan said she's wor worked at the uh, YMCA for 36 years in the Harrisburg area. Uh, so thank you, Susan. One of the things that you know we didn't get a chance to mention earlier, we want to make sure we sneak in is the work that WISE did during the uh, civil rights movement, uh, hosting a lot of the meetings uh, for the civil rights leaders. Yes, and, and what I should mention is we, you know, we said the first YMCA was started in, in Boston in 1851. Yeah. The first African-American YMCA um, was uh, started in 1853 in Washington, D.C. by a freed slave. Mm. Uh, his name was Anthony Bowen. Um, and that was the first non-church African-American organization established in the United States. Wow. Um, 
And today the, the Anthony Bowen YMCA um, is still very much alive and active in Washington. It was one of the first Ys that I visited. Um, really encourage anyone when you're in um, Washington to go see that Y. There's just incredible history there. There's this beautiful timelines of the history um, of African-Americans coming to that Y and being a part of the Washington DC community, which was foundational. Um, so yeah, Ys were active in civil rights. Uh, being, well, Ys were always from the beginning places of um, uh, providing education and opportunity, You know, starting specifically with um, African-American young men. And today, of course, um, uh, you know, people from all over. Um, and, and, and while we did, you know, I, I do think it's important, Neil, that while we were a place for organizers to connect and um, get involved, you know, we have our own history. Um, uh, you know, in the 1960s, we still had 300 wives that were segregated. Mm. Um, and so we had to go through our own um, integration process. Um, and there were, I think there were one or two Ys who at the at the time when it became a national mandate to integrate that um, I think there was one that left because it was not going to comply. So so while we have a history of inclusion, um, you know, we also have to own, you know, our our and we had some great firsts um, in in including African Americans in the work. We also had some, you know, our own sad moments in how we showed up. Thank you for sharing that, Suzanne. It really is uh, powerful to hear you say that and to acknowledge that that history. Um, Katie mentions that the Anthony Bowen Y was a site of the Underground Railroad, uh, which I thought was really interesting. And uh, Sunny Slaughter, her name and face aren't showing up on Facebook uh, through StreamYard, unfortunately, but she says, wow, that's some powerful history. She'll definitely be going to visit. She lives here in the um, uh, DC area. Uh, and she was our guest when we did a special uh, edition of the read along, uh, the New York Times read along, focusing on the 1619 project, the legacy oh, of slavery. That um, was awesome. You remember that? Um, that was, yes. yeah. it was a great episode. Uh, and I had the pleasure of going to Sunny's house for that. Uh, and she's been a, a, a regular viewer since. She's appeared on several shows. Um, and uh, thank you, Sunny, for all of your support. Jim shares that Irving Berlin wrote a song, wonderful song, I Can Always Find a Little Sunshine at the YMCA, based on his experience as an infantryman in World War I. The Y had places in the battlefield where soldiers could gather to write home, socialize, and just get a little break. Um, so again, a, a good picture of the Y's role in history. Um, and uh, Suzanne, really thrilled that you were able to join us today to talk about the Y. Uh, 15th president, first woman uh, president and CEO. Um, before we move to the paper, um, how important was that to you in terms of, you know, what's interesting with an MPT, the Nonprofit Times 50 list, there were more women than men on that list this year. Um, and and to be the first woman at the YMCA, what, what did that mean for you personally? Well, first and foremost, I was drawn to the position because of the mission of the organization and the values of the organization. Um, to be the first woman is, um, well, you know, of course it feels, well, it, it's it's kind of this mixed bag of saying, yeah, it feels like an honor. And also, why did it take so long? Um, you know, and because, you know, the why the Y is a place for all people, and there are as many women at the Y as there are men. Um, so, you know, I think it's positive. I think, you know, diverse leadership in organizations brings new perspective. And so, yes, I definitely bring a perspective as a mom, um, as a prime decision maker for my kids, um, that I think is is probably a, a healthy lens as we look at our work. Um, but it, it was, it was, it was, Clearly, a point of pride. Um, also, because I have, um, you know, a 19-year-old daughter, and so as a role model, um, my goddaughter is walking through the dining room right now. Hannah, how old are you? 20, 26. 26, and to also be a role model for Hannah um, uh, as a CEO leader. Um, so it feels really good. Um, and now my son, who is 22, um, uh, he also. Um, 
sees me as um, as good collateral because um, um, the, his his young women friends um, uh, he he told me I'm queen. <laughs> And that there are a lot of young women that he knows who um, admire the the um, mod value my role modeling for them. Absolutely, we certainly uh, share Katie's thoughts. We love Suzanne; she's such a hopeful and inspiring leader. Uh, I certainly found that when I worked with you at United Way, Suzanne. Uh, you mentioned your your kids and your son, your twenty two year old. Uh, you're a military mom, right? He's still I in am. the I, army. I I'm an army mom, which is one of the reasons that I have also really loved learning about the history of the YMCA with the armed services. That could be a whole other conversation. We, we actually have an armed services YMCA that, that um, it, it, it brings all the programming and, and community building um, to enlisted military families. Um, and that, you know, is really important to me because my son is enlisted. Um, he is, um, he actually got promoted to Sergeant this year, Neil. So Congratulations. He's a, he's a Sergeant with the army's 75th Ranger regiment. Um, I remember when he went to boot camp, uh, yeah. and your post, uh, yeah. when you dropped him off and, yeah, you, know, you couldn't speak for with him for a couple of weeks, I think, right? Um, it was longer than that. <laughs> how longer? It, it, it's it was incredible to watch uh, uh, from afar. So thank you, and please thank him for his his service. I will. Um, Rachel uh, put in a link to the Counts family archives. Uh, if folks want to learn more, I'm not sure what that reference is to, though. I can tell you, Neil. This is um. I, I, this is this is like an incredible asset, you know, as an organization, we actually have an archivist, his name is Ryan Bean, and all of the history of, of our history is archived at um, the University of Minnesota in the, oh, wow. um, the um, I guess, I don't know how to say it either, Cotts Family Archives. And so um, people can go and visit. Um, I know that's on my um, list, uh, priority list for the beginning of next year is to go spend a couple of days with Ryan. And, um, and and what he has offered is, you know, an opportunity to come and immerse myself in different parts of our history. I, for one, want to go and really learn about um, uh, our history of women becoming involved in the YMCA. You know, I know that on a surface, um, actually, Jim Horry and I, who I mentioned, we were talking about, um, he, he, he wants to go learn more about the history in the internment camps. And that really piqued my curiosity as well. Um, so... Um, uh, yeah, that's a great resource. Um, sure. If you want to hear more. Sure. So as we uh, transition to the paper, uh, uh, again, there are several topics we want to try and cover. I uh, want to look at the paper as well, but um, uh, I want to take a moment, and Suzanne, I'm going to give you uh, the floor. It's the 24th an 21st anniversary of 9-11. Um, do you remember where you were? Uh, can you tell us what was happening when you found out? <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is like, it was doubly miserable. Um, I was in, this is probably oversharing. I was, um, I was in my dentist chair having a root canal uh, and we were listening to the radio and, um, and, you know, heard a plane had crashed and we, the TV wasn't on. I don't even know if they had, at, if they had a TV at my, at my dentist's office. And so for a couple hours, we're just in the dentist chair listening. And then when I was done, I went, I worked for the United Way of Greater Portland. And when I was done, I went um, back to the office. And that's where I found my colleagues crowded around the, um, around the television. And um, we, you know, stayed together for a while and, um, and then broke up after that um, and went home. Yeah, I do remember that night standing over my son, his crib. He was um, he was a he was gonna he would turn one uh, about six weeks after that, um, so he was a baby. And I just remember my husband and I standing over his crib, like I'm sure so many other parents did, um, and just thought about wow, how the world had changed and what was the world going to be like for him. Wow, thank you, thank you so much for for sharing that. Um, I was in Seattle myself uh, and had uh, um, just picked up friends from the airport the night before. So uh, we were, you know, we had gotten to bed late and uh, I missed the first phone call from my mom. And then when my mother-in-law called, uh, I think an hour later, 
uh, I woke up just saying, hey, how you doing? Yeah, we're tired. We went to the airport. She's like, Neil, Neil, stop, stop. Put on the TV. You know, it was like that kind of a yeah. exchange. And then we were just in shock um, until, uh, you know, for the next several days. Um, let's go ahead and, and uh, just turn our attention to the paper. Um, give me a moment while I switch the uh, camera um, and we'll take a look at what we have in the paper today. Um, so there we go. Uh, and we have the, the front page and we will uh, set this up so that we'll put the paper larger. There we go. And um, we'll focus on uh, the news of the week. Uh, again, I thought it was interesting that Queen Elizabeth was off the front page, uh, the top of the fold at least, um, for today. Um, this display story is about failing schools. Uh, Hasidic students in New York State are being deprived of basic skills. It's a question of how much funding uh, are being is being sent to those schools and how much is being actually used. Uh, Ukraine reclaims key eastern city. Uh, Trump's lawyers seek legal aid for themselves. Um, and then here's a, an important story. It's kind of hard to tell with the headline, Rose Reversal Changes Ways Doctors Work. Um, and uh, in Wisconsin, a group of doctors and lawyers are is trying to come up with guidelines on how to comply with a newly revived 173-year-old law that prohibits abortion except to save the life of a pregnant woman. Uh, so the the impact of that law on, on health care um, has been profound. Um, and it's had a profound influence on politics as well. Um, the number of women that have uh, registered to vote, for example, has uh, gone up considerably. Um, let's see here. There we go. It's a little better view of the paper. Uh, so let's take a look at what's inside. And if there's anything that catches your attention, Suzanne, please uh, let me know. Well, well, Neil, one thing, I comment I was sure. going to make on the, the article on the failing schools is yeah. um, one of the areas that I have just, I was actually doing another podcast this week with an organization called Defining Us. It's really focused on um, focused on public education in New York, um, state of New York and, and New York City also. Um, but they're, they're really looking at um, um, mental health issues for kids. And, um, and so when we think about, you know, failing funding and then kids showing up with you know, even greater needs, um, I think I, I look at it through the lens of the YMCA, uh, our potential to be a partner in helping schools, um, you know, when they are facing, as I said, like we come in, we do youth in government, we do out of school time. Um, but I, I, uh, dug a little deeper earlier this week in understanding how some of our whys in New York specifically are engaging with their school districts um, to help with the challenges that that kids are facing around mental health. Um, we've got a YMCA in Yonkers that has a really strong partnership with the school district. Um, and they bring in um, mental health counselors programming, uh, New York City. So that's when I saw that headline, it made me think about you know, when we see school districts um, facing challenges and lack of funding, you know, what are the opportunities for community partners like the YMCA and other nonprofits to be in that space with them? So that was it was just top of mind for me when I saw the headline. Sure, absolutely. And I do want to uh, bring up Paula Kiger um, shared a comment about um, an effort to on, on the anniversary of 9-11, uh, remember the sky. Uh, this effort to take a picture of the sky today and share on social media. Um, there's, uh, uh, at least in New York, a lot of folks who were there. I was in Seattle, but uh, people remember what the sky looked like that morning. It was a, a beautiful blue. Um, so I encourage day. you to check out um, Remember the Sky um, on social media. The uh, page two uh, and this story, uh, this column is actually my favorite. It's called Inside the Times. Um, this uh, it's an internal look. It's usually interviews with the uh, reporters who've worked on various stories. This is the wild, the wide world of narrow beats. Sometimes specific areas of coverage allow reporters to ask big questions. 
Um, and this is an article interview with uh, Kenneth Chang, a science writer who reports on outer space, says he has the wonder beat. Um, and then, uh, oh, the future of work reporter Emma Goldberg writes about, as a teammate once said, business vibes. So kind of an interesting take on on coverage in the paper. Uh, headline in history, we talked about the wise history. Uh, this headline that the, uh, the Times is pulling out, Nelson Rockefeller offers aid to keep Dodgers in the city. This is before the Dodgers left Brooklyn for Los Angeles, September 11, 1957. Uh, of course, he was unsuccessful in that effort. Um, page three, they have this section uh, of interest, noteworthy facts from today's paper. It's a way to draw people in to various uh, stories. From 86 to 94, hundreds of Cubans suffering extreme economic hardship injected themselves with HIV-infected blood to gain admittance to sanitariums that offered regular meals and air conditioning. That's what in you, the book review, like Desperate Measures. That's incredible. That is um, incredible. There's a spotlight piece the seven, about uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, the seven-decade reign of Queen Elizabeth II, who died on Thursday. Um made her the only sovereign that most Britons have ever known. Below, a London-based correspondent for the time shares what it was like as the news of the Queen's death spread throughout Britain. Um, and then here is a piece of service journalism uh, here to help how to wear a backpack the right way. Um, <laughs> so many kids just sling one arm, uh, you know, use one arm on the backpack, right, Suzanne? Yeah. Okay. Um, Good to, my kids, I think, are past that, but good to know. Uh, it's a, adjust to sit high and close to your body. Lighten up, certainly. Uh, pack heavier items closer to your back. And if you have hip pain, load weight on your bad side. So to some counter, interesting counter thoughts there. Yourself. Yeah. Uh, the international section starts with a uh, full page story, give you the sense of the, the page. Hero, traitor, or both. Uh, Petan's legacy haunts a tiny island. Um, this is uh, outside of France, uh, an island off France. The deathbed of Philippe Petan, who led France to victory in World War I and then collaborated with Nazi Germany at the Historical Museum, uh, the French island where he died in 1951. Oh, I'm gonna I'm in, I'm gonna read that, Neil. I'm reading a book right now, um, Kristen Hanna's *The Nightingale*, and it is about the. Um, it's a story of two women, um, one of two sisters, one of whom joins the French resistance. Um, yeah, that's great. I'm gonna mm -hmm. check that out. I'm Absolutely. right in the middle of it right now. Good, good. Um, we have some an article about. Uh, with tears and steel, Kenya's hustler president vanquishes his foes. Um, five sentenced over seditious books in Seoul, South Korea, part of a children's book published by the speech therapist, was displayed last year during a Hong Kong police news conference. Um, and then here is uh, some inside pages uh, covering the uh, um, Queen Elizabeth, uh, King Charles is officially proclaimed, uh, King Charles III, rather, with pomp and circumstance. And in bidding farewell to Queen, UK grapples with identity. Um, how did you, how did, what was your, what was your take on, on King Charles III's uh, first message out? Did you, did you? I how, did how not you catch it, it, Suzanne. No, you didn't catch it. What? I, I thought he showed up with um, authenticity and warmth. That was my critique. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think he's been, you know, he's gone through that history of being somewhat unlikable, which I'm trying to be generous during periods of time. But he um, he he came off, I thought, warm, um, which they probably need. Absolutely. I was going to mention that we do have gift links on our website uh, to the obit and to uh, the photo gallery from The New York Times if folks are interested. So you can go to our website. Um, you can click on readalong.link slash Queen Elizabeth to get those uh, gift links if you don't have a subscription to the paper. Um, and we took a look at the, uh, uh, the, Thursday, the 
Friday paper earlier in terms of the way they, they laid it out. More stories about Ukraine, of course. Um, and then the national section, Nuclear Town rethinks its pride in building the bomb. This is a Richland, uh, based in Richland, Washington. Um, that's an interesting, um, interesting story. I actually spent a summer in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, working on a, a congressional campaign there, 1994, quite a few years ago. Uh, um, but it's it's a real interesting in terms of the legacy of both uh, Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, and Richland, uh, Washington. Uh, where the Manhattan Project was was based. Here's the inside of that story on uh, those uh, Hasidic schools receiving public funds um, and New York Times investigation into that. And so a, you can see how long the, uh, how much uh, space they gave to that story. Four pages inside, some very huge big pictures as well. Um, a story from Las Vegas reporter whose beat was vice in Las Vegas needs a violent end. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think it was like Clark County administrator who whacked him. Wow. Um, it, journalism is uh, under attack. I mean, we, you know, both and we, we've seen it abroad, but increasingly here as well. And certainly over the last uh, few years with uh, President Trump, um, I don't think we can, we should underestimate the challenges that journalists face just doing their jobs on a daily basis. Um, there's stories about Trump and about Roe v. Wade as well. Um, speaking about that, I do want to mention uh, there is an effort to address that. There is a, a thing called Democracy Day uh, 2022. You can find more information at usdemocracyday.org. Um, and uh, it's an effort uh, by news organizations um, to come together and fight back effectively against these assaults on, on democracy. Uh, so check that out on uh, the 15th later this week. Is that a virtual event, Neil? It, it's a, it's a campaign actually, okay. Suzanne. Um, so we can share a little bit more information about that, uh, real quick. Um, let's see here. Pull up the website. Um, there we go. So this is um, uh, the website for Democracy Day. It's a nationwide collaborative. Democracy in the U.S. is under threat. The goal is to draw attention to the crisis and how individuals can respond. It's an effort to draw attention to the crisis, provide the public with the context and information they need, and bring all types of media together to sound the alarm collectively. The main idea, we're currently facing an unrelenting assault on our democracy a clear and present threat to our constitutional rights and our ability as journalists to exist and do our jobs. But as we inch closer to a possible democratic collapse in 2024, the magnitude of that threat isn't well understood by all Americans. There's a webinar, uh, they're incentivizing media coverage. Uh, they have a number of partners as well. Um, so certainly encourage folks to, to check that out. And we'll get back to the the paper. So the, uh, as, as I mentioned, the, um, let's take the, oops. you're seeing more of my room today than I, I would have expected, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's what happens when your cameras go offline, right? Um, so the opinion section, uh, the front page is about uh, the queen. What is Britain without Queen Elizabeth? Um, and what they tease at the top, uh, a ring of highways in downtown Houston divides neighborhoods along racial lines. Um, that's an important story. And we covered that in the 1619 project um, in terms of how uh, um, 
the way that the highways were set up, how it impacted communities, cut people off from each other. Um, that's an important story. Have you seen that in around Tampa, Suzanne, how the highways impact neighborhoods? Yes, and it, it has been. I remember moving here. Um, there were um, organized community conversations because there's a there's a ton of highway construction that happens around Tampa. Um, and so it sounds like a familiar story. Um, so in the um, the opinion section, uh, here's a, uh, a, a picture and a quote, Jim Maroon, New York City. Uh, so that's the picture. I started working at the September 11 Memorial about 10 years ago. Not many people want to do this work. I was drawn to it at first because there weren't many people around when I was working. So sometimes I wonder if I chose this job or if it chose me. It's probably God's plan that I wound up taking care of these pools. Wow. Um, I, um, I, I found myself there for the first time this year. I had not been back. I, my husband and I, we had like I'd worked in New York City. Um, but I had not been back until this year, and I happened upon it. I was there um, going to meet with the um, head of a major corporate foundation and had some time and sort of looked across the street and saw it and went over, and oh my gosh, I mean, I, probably everyone who's seen it, it was just it was incredible, such an emotional experience. There's a column by Maureen Dowd, Charles in Charge, um, of course, about King Charles III. Um, and here's an interesting piece, uh, two articles and then images in the, in the middle. I'll try and zoom up so you can see the full layout. On the left, Elizabeth II loved her job. Without the queen, how will anyone know how to be British anymore is the um, pull quote. And then mourn the queen, not her empire. Um, Maya uh, Jasnoff, professor of history at Harvard and the author most recently, The Dawn Watch, Joseph Conrad in a global world. She helped to obscure Britain's bloody legacy of decolonization. Um, and then you see the images here. And that's not a, uh, a point to uh, leave too quickly. Um, in a lot of the uh, uh, posts that I saw on social media, I mean, certainly there was the, the mourning for, for Queen Elizabeth and, and the impact she had over her reign. Um, but it also, you know, it's, the legacy of empire and the legacy of colonialism, um, which also, you know, my parents uh, being from India can't be overlooked uh, and can't be uh, brushed aside. Um, it's, it's a question of both and, I think. Um, you have to be able to have uh, two conflicting thoughts at the same time, and that's not always easy. Uh, here's a, the inside piece about the highway. Uh, what Antarctica's, Antarctica's disintegration asks of us, uh, climate change. And uh, an interesting piece about uh, Mayor Giuliani, America's mayor finds himself alone. September 11 was Rudy Giuliani's triumph and his undoing. An opinion piece, Pat Buchanan paved the way for Trump. Um, censorship, censorship is the refuge of the weak. Here we go. That's and then it gets to the last page. The twisted reality of selling plasma for money. So that is the opinion section. We barely scratched the surface of the paper, Suzanne, and it's uh, pushing nine fifty. Um, is there a section that you want to take a look at before we start wrapping up? We have business styles, one of the arts previews. I'll let you choose, Neil. You're, you're the expert with the times. Dealer's choice, huh? Yes, dealer's choice. Um, I will. I don't think that we'd be able to get through all the arts, but There's just to see him see it light, laid out. Um, you know, this is part one. Uh, theater, and then. Uh, part two, theater, dance, classical, film, television, pop books, art, and architecture. We have links on our website um, to these sections if people are interested. Um, Paula can share the link to our blog post where you can find uh, the links. So I definitely encourage people to check that out. We have the book review. What I do want to do is to make sure that we spend a little time with the magazine, especially because of the, the cover. It was so interesting. 
how educators and students are navigating the hyper-politicized terrain of American education. Um, so there is, here are the pages inside. I am definitely gonna check that out because that is, you know, top of mind both as parents, but as, you know, leading a youth development organization, um, understanding is, understanding that is so important. Sure. Um, we'll take a look. We'll make sure to come back. We'll close with the poem uh, in just a moment. Let me see if I can find the inside pages of that story. Uh, the education issue, Eye of the Storm, how educators and students are navigating the hyper-politicized terrain of American education. Oh. So that's actually interesting that, you know, although they have um, this as the cover, they almost have an inside cover as well. And I wonder if you can almost pull this out. Maybe not. Uh, we'll see. When a campus clash is caught on video, how the opening of a multicultural student center at Arizona State University spiraled into a viral nightmare. That's interesting. Um, that's a, the whole story is just about that, actually. It looks like what allowed any of this to happen in the first place and what might have been done to stop it. Read it, read Scare, how a battle over what should stay on the bookshelves in the local library turned a Texas town upside down. Book banning is alive and well, unfortunately. A change of course, what happened when a superintendent in Northern Michigan brought the fight over race into her schools. Here's a full quote, Rosie Vasquez, a mother who praised, let's see if I can get it close in there, praised uh, Leland School Superintendent Stephanie Long for confronting the area's racism. Um, So some very, very good coverage around education. Run for the money. America's allocating nearly a 90, 190 billion for pandemic recovery in schools, but can they spend it in a way that ultimately matters? Mm -hmm. A lot to look through here. Yeah, I'm gonna spend some time with that. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna close with the poem. This is a, a tradition on the read along, uh, Suzanne. We, uh, you know, as Sri always says, a poem should be read by the person who wrote it because they understand the, the uh, cadence, where the emphasis should be, et cetera. It should never, never be read cold. We read it, we, we read it anyway um, and do our best. Uh, so first I'm gonna share the background on this poem. Um, and uh, as a, a trigger warning, it's not for the faint of heart. The Polish poet, uh, I don't know how to pronounce their name. Um, uh, Polish poet's the September 11 poem, translated by Claire Kavanaugh, immortalizes those who jumped from the World Trade Center towers by intentionally not imagining how they must have felt. Instead, the poem relies on simple description to open the imagination and memory. The poem's uh, tercets evoke an uneasy balance until the fourth stanza where a quark Quatrain appears, suspending time for just a little bit longer, like those who leaped from the burning floors. The M dash in the final stanza echoes the one in the first, connecting those who jump to the poet. The only viable response of the poet is suspension and silence. Here is photograph from September 11. Let's see if I can get the uh, text. They jumped from the burning floors, one, two, a few more, higher, lower. The photograph halted them in life and now keeps them above the earth, above the earth, toward the earth. Each is still complete with a particular face and blood well hidden. There's enough time for hair to come loose, for keys and coins to fall from pockets. They're still within the air's reach, within the compass of places that have just now opened. I can only do two things for them, 
describe this flight and not add a last line. Hard not to think about that day and yeah. the images that we saw all too often on September 11. Really powerful. Absolutely. Um, Suzanne, we're gonna give you a break. Uh, we're gonna take you um, off screen for a moment. And um, we're gonna let, let you uh, uh, think about final thoughts that you might want to share with us. Um, and then we'll, sorry, we'll bring you back and uh, we'll ask you to share both uh, some final thoughts about the why and a pro tip for journalists in covering the why. Okay. Um, so again, my name is Neil Parikh. Uh, thank you for bearing with us with some of the technical challenges today with audio and uh, some of the cameras going offline, but luckily we had a cell phone that could make it work. Again, the angles were a little funny, but it was still a great show. We learned a lot about the why from Suzanne McCormick, the president and CEO of YMCA of the USA. I wanna give a, a shout out to our team. Sri Sri Austin, of course, it, Sri Srinivasan is our host, of course. I'm the executive producer and guest host. But most importantly, Paula Kiger is our producer working in Facebook and LinkedIn to provide context for the conversation, links to stories, uh, et cetera, background on the why. Thank you so much for Paula for everything that you do. Uh, and Paula is in New York City this weekend. Uh, Want to give a shout out to Muckrack our sponsor. Uh, if you're interested in being a sponsor, please uh, contact Sri or myself. Uh, uh, Sri's email is sri at digimentors.group. Mine is neil at digimentors.group. And speaking of Digimentors, the New York Times Read Along is produced by Digimentors. We produce high quality virtual and hybrid events. Um, we also do uh, training, workshops, um, all sorts of uh, consulting if you need help. Um, we also do social media audits. If you're interested in having us produce a show like this for you, uh, please reach out to Sri or myself and we'd love to uh, talk with you. A number of groups that we're working with are moving to hybrid events. Uh, they see the reach of, of, you know, they want people, people want to come together, but they also see the value in reaching a, a larger audience. Uh, in some faces, cases, a global audience. Um, so reach out if we can help you with a show or any social media work, recruitment, et cetera. We'd love to work with you. And finally, we'd like to give a shout out to the Local Connection. Uh, the Local Connection newsletter is put out by the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University uh, every week. It offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. And best of all, it's free. You can subscribe at bit.ly slash local news tips, bit.ly slash local news tips. And they are also one of the um, organizations behind Democracy Day um, 2022. So you can learn more at usdemocracyday.org. Uh, that was, uh, we talked about that earlier in the show, an effort by uh, media organizations to fight back on the against the assault on democracy. So with that, we will bring back uh, Suzanne um, and um, ask her to share some final thoughts um, about the why, uh, and then also share a some guidance or pro tips for journalists in covering the why, uh, Suzanne. Uh, Thanks, so go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for having me um, once again. 
Uh, I, I think the sort of parting thought I want to um, share with everyone who's listening is um, so often we think of the why, you know, as a place in community, and it absolutely is. We have 2,800 actual why facilities across America, um, and, and we want you to know that, and we want you to be a part of that, and um, want you to know that we, um, the why extends far beyond the walls of those why buildings. There is why programming that is happening in thousands of schools across this country, thousands of other community based organizations and and um, hundreds of neighborhoods and housing um, complexes. So um, yeah, we, are, we, we are much more than than what you see um, in a building and just want to um, share that as a parting thought. Um, and I, I don't know if this is a pro tip or not, Neil, but I would say, you know, and thinking about covering the why is as, as journalists are looking or thinking about stories about the health and well-being of the community, the YMCA can be a great resource for the human stories. Um, as I said, every day we are touching the lives of families and children, and we have real stories about the impact of, um, of, of what's happening in America, what's happening for kids, what's happening for families, and we would love to bring those stories to them. Thank you, Suzanne. That was that was great. Um, Katie says thank you uh, for uh, having our awesome boss on the show. Um, so, Katie, we agree. We think uh, Suzanne is awesome. My mom also says thank you um, uh, for being such a great guest. Um, again, our guest was Suzanne McCormick, um, the president and CEO of the Y. Ken Fisher also shares his thoughts. His thank you to the producers. Um, and uh, the YMCA is the noblest of missions. I think that's a, a great praise. Ken is one of our uh, regular viewers, Suzanne. Um, so Thank it's always you. good to see that. Um, and so for folks, in case you joined us uh, late, the uh, show will be will air from the beginning on the same channels, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on our digital Center's website. Just a few minutes after we go off the air, you'll be able to watch from the very beginning. Uh, we spent the first you know, 30 minutes or so uh, uh, you know, talking with uh, Suzanne about the why, about the history of the why, some of the great work they do. And then we covered the, uh, the news of the day, talking about Queen Elizabeth and September 11, among other things. Um, thank you again for spending some of your Sunday with us. Again, this is uh, the 21st anniversary of September 11. Um, so it's a special day for a lot of folks. And uh, we thank you for, for taking the time. Uh, with that, uh, Suzanne, we'll, uh, we'll let you go and um, we'll catch you, uh, catch you soon. Thanks, Neil. Bye, everyone. Bye.